Uh, he is uh, from our genetics department in the School of Medicine. And he has a quite inspirational background, I would say. Uh, Tom uh, received his uh, BS from the University of Michigan and PhD from the uh, University of Illinois and Urbana-Champaign, uh, both in mathematics. Uh, and then he spent one year uh, at Canyon College as a visiting assistant professor, and then he joined uh, Marietta College in Ohio uh, as an assistant professor. He got his tenure there, uh, he became an associate professor, but then he decided that he wanted a new challenge. He went up on to do his master's uh, in biostatistics in, uh, at Harvard. Uh, after getting his uh, master's, he spent uh, some more time in Boston uh, as a postdoctoral researcher at Dana Faber uh, Cancer Institute and uh, Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. And then finally, he came back to Ohio as an assistant professor of genetics. Uh, he is also an adjunct staff at Cleveland Clinic uh, Genomic Medicine Institute. And uh, he is now with us uh, to present his research. Please. Okay. Thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, I was just telling Mehmet, it's great to be able to talk to a computational crowd because I'm these days I'm so used to talking to biologists that I have to sort of have to hide all the mathematics and you know I'm not allowed to show any equations or anything. So, so uh, now it's nice to be able to actually expose some of the mathematics because I usually don't get to talk to folks like you. So uh, it's a real treat. Um, so I thought I'd start with this slide and this, this is just the slide the, the, for the Human Genome Project. And the reason I wanted to start with this is twofold. Is there a pointer? Do you have a laser pointer available? Sorry, I should have asked before. If, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Sorry, I should have thought of that before I began. I'll, I'll, I'll forge on while you, while you get it. Um, <coughs> yeah, the reason I wanted to mention this is twofold. First of all, everything I'm going to talk about today absolutely relies on the results of this project, which was sort of formally completed in 2003. So just. Is there, a, is there an old-fashioned stick, no, stick-like stick pointer? Just the, the just the finger? Yeah. I'd feel better with one of those big okay. sticks like that. But, um, And the second reason is since, you know, this is sort of an interdisciplinary sort of talk, um, in a sense, uh, one of the emphasis, emphases of the Human Genome Project was the interdisciplinary approach. So you can see in the little circle up above, we've got informatics, which is sort of you know, obviously represented by computer science, and then you've got biology and physics and so forth. So it really is sort of, um, you know, coming from the biological side nowadays, sort of an interdisciplinary world. And uh, I know, you know, a lot of the emphases of the computer science department here have become sort of biological. So one of the results of the Human Genome Project was to, at least on paper, be able to specify base by base the human genome sequence, at least the haploid version of it, that is three billion letters of the consensus sequence. So that part of the sequence was just sort of assumed to be common among all of us, although it really isn't. And of course, it's organized into 23 pairs of chromosomes and you inherit one copy of each from each parent. But what we're really interested in is the part of the genome that's not common across us all. And this is a quote shortly after the, the initial draft of the human genome sequence was published from Francis Collins and Victor McCusick, who uh, the latter just died this July, actually, um, that while human DNA sequences are 99.9% .9 identical, what we're really interested in with regard to disease susceptibility is the remaining 0.1% um, of variation. And those are the, the, the parts of the sequence that we're really interested in in terms of disease susceptibility and so forth. Thanks very much. So up until very recently, it was, it was believed that the absolute most common and important part of human genetic variation took the form of single nucleotide polymorphisms. And these are just single base differences. Um, where each version of the base appears in some significant proportion of the human population. So they're estimated to occur 
every 100 to 300 bases. And estimates are that there are approximately 10 million. Not all of these have been validated. Um, and the, the sort of major database that catalogs and characterizes these variants is dbSNP. And currently, there's something like 6 million validated SNPs in dbSNP. So most of you probably know this, but just in case, um, this is just a specific example of a real SNP. So if you look in the black, this is real sequence from chromosome 18, just moving along the chromosome. And all of us share, in both copies of chromosome 18, this sequence in these positions. But if you come to this particular base, indicated here in teal, um, this is an AC SNP, and it's been validated. It's in DB SNP. And they use these RS identifiers to indicate, um, to, to identify the SNPs. So what the Human Genome Project has allowed is to actually put genomic coordinates on these positions. So literally, this position, if you start counting from the end of chromosome 18, one by one, once you get to position 53,945,237, you come right to this spot, and 70% of our chromosomes have an A at that spot, and 30% have a C there. But of course, we're diploid creatures. We get one from mom and one from dad. So it turns out that, you know, if you look uh, in this audience, probably, something like half of us will have an AA genotype there, half of us, or 40% an AC, and 10% a CC. So there are 10 million of these, roughly, um, across the genome. And of course, um, commercial enterprises have sort of caught up with this. And now, amazingly, we're able to assay in one uh, technology, or actually these two companies have gobbled up a lot of the market share, hundreds of thousands of these genotypes from an individual at once. And this is the Affymetrix platform. And this is the Illumina platform. And they pretty much, these two companies have pretty much courted the market in um, SNP genotyping technology. Most of you are probably more familiar with expression arrays that, that Affymetrix developed. And the technology is quite similar. But these are genotyping DNA, not, not RNA, not mRNA. This is not expression arrays, but SNP genotyping arrays. So these, the history of these things, I mean, it's amazing how quickly it exploded. Just five years ago, the state of the art was the Affymetrix 10K array, which could genotype 10,000 SNPs in one assay. But, you know, it just exploded. And now, actually, as of about two years ago, um, the 1 million array is available from Affymetrix. So it's gone hundredfold in just a few years. And Illumina has, has pretty much kept pace, and they have their own 1 million array. Um, right now. So, so now you can take an individual's DNA, throw it on this array, and immediately get, um, well not immediately, but eventually get a million SNP genotype um, from that particular individual. So what it, from a data perspective, what does this look like? Well, the Illumina array is a little bit simpler because each SNP gives sort of an A signal and a B signal for the two different alleles. That's the A and C that I showed you before. Um, so you, you get two measurements per SNP. So if you think about it, if you do an experiment with n people, which you know usually you don't just run one individual's genotype or one individual's DNA, if you think about it, you can think about it as a big matrix with n columns and two million rows. So it's it's a pretty big uh, amount of data to handle. So there's there's some serious data housing and data processing issues that you have to deal with. And the latest version of the Affymetrix array is actually even more data intensive because it produces six measurements for each SNP, three for the A allele and three for the B allele. They're actually kind of repeated measurements in the latest version of the array. So um, if you think of this one, it's actually greater than six million rows and n columns if you have n individuals. So there, you know, this is not something you're going to do in Excel typically. You're, you, know, you have to do something a little more sophisticated than that. So just a little bit of a peek under the hood, and this is, this is more, um, you know, this is less um, a data um, slide than it is sort of a technolo technology slide. So both of these platforms start with the DNA that's sort of chopped up. So you take the individual's DNA, and you know, you think about it as being fragmented, 
And then there's all these fragments sort of floating around in the soup. And on each of these fragments is a SNP that you're interested in genotyping. So, you know, everyone's DNA has these letters in the black, and then you come to this, and this, this doesn't mean A and C are here, it means either A or C are here. So if the individual is a heterozygous, if they have an AC genotype, then half of their DNA is going to have an A here, half a C here. And for those who are homozygous, it'll be both fragments will have A or both fragments will have C. So that's the general idea. So what happens is both of these technologies re rely on so-called Watson-Crick base pairs, where for biochemical reasons, A wants to stick to T and G wants to stick to C. So what happens is, magically to me, um, this DNA actually finds the probe that it's complementary to. So in the Illumina case, they have a million different versions of these beads, and each bead has a little probe that's complementary to the DNA up to, but not including the SNP site. And by complementary, I mean, you know, G goes with C, T goes with A, G goes with C. So it actually literally sticks there. And then the SNP site is sort of left hanging, and in the soup they have these little single base extensions. The A's and T's are labeled in red, the G's and C's are labeled in green. And so if the individual has an A here, the red will find its way there, and the optical scanner will see the red signal. Whereas if a C is here, the optical scanner will see the green signal, and if they're heterozygote, it'll see a little red and a little green. That's a little bit of a simplification, but that's basically how it works. So the affymetrics is, is a similar principle, but it's a little bit different because it actually has the SNP site in the middle of the 25 base probe, and they label the DNA fluorescently so that you, the DNA actually lights up when it binds, and you have some nonspecific binding. But the general principle is that the, the closer the DNA matches the probe, the brighter the intensity will be on the chip. So that's just a, a sort of a quick overview of how the technology works. Here's a little cartoon. Um, you have the DNA, and it hybridizes it to the array, and then you wash it off. And only the DNA that's complementary to the probes um, will sort of stick. And then it lights up. You have an optical scanner with the intensity measurements, and then the sort of statistics or the computer science or the modeling or what have you kick in and you interpret these intensity measurements um, with regard to uh, genotype and other sorts of things that I'll talk about. So these things were originally developed for gene, um, uh, genome-wide association studies, that is, to try to track down the variants that contribute to disease susceptibility. So a simplified version of that is you know, what we're trying to find is, again, moving along the genome, everyone has this. Then you hit the SNP site, and we're trying to find SNPs where if you happen to inherit the A allele, say, then you're less likely to get, say, prostate cancer. But if you happen to inherit the C allele, then you're more likely to get prostate cancer. And that's, that was originally the idea in mind um, behind these, these tools to try to track down these variants, and there's been a a huge body of literature already um, um, looking at a variety of diseases, including cancer, and inherited susceptibility to these diseases. But in just, just four years ago, the community kind of got thrown for a loop because all of a sudden researchers realized, and these are the two seminal papers that sort of track these things down, that SNPs weren't the only game in town. In fact, there's um, something called copy number variation, where instead of just single base differences between two individuals, you had entire chunks of DNA that were, the, were either duplicated or missing when you compare the two individuals. So, something less than three billion. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's basically, yeah. This, this is the slide. So. So literally, and, and there are um, biological reasons why this happens during recombination. That's what people think the mechanism is. But, you know, if you imagine that ancestrally, if we go back enough to a common ancestor, we all have, say, this sequence, which is, say, a million letters long there. Then there are regions in the genome, lots of regions in the genome, it turns out, where a lot of us actually have that sequence duplicated. 
or a lot of us have that sequence deleted. And these are all over the place in the genome. And no, nobody realized it until like four years ago that it was so widespread. People thought that it was just um, a weird phenomenon associated with certain mental retardation syndromes and such. But it turns out that it's really common, and some of it seems to have no phenotype involved. So, um, so this, this is a really hot area of research right now, and I know some folks, including Jing, are, are interested in this, and, and we're, in my group, are looking at this, and um, lots of people. And um, so, technically, the community decided that just arbitrarily, they would say, it has to be at least 1,000 bases long. Uh, so that's what you call a CNV that's at least 1,000 bases long and is, is variable if you look across the populations, how many copies it is. So it can be zero copies on a chromosome, one copy, which we call normal, two copies, or in weird cases, you can have many, many copies of it. Um, it's still early days, but rough estimates are that some 12% of the genome is copy number polymorphic. And if you take any two individuals, Again, it's, it's, these are just estimates, but CNVs account for between perhaps 4 and 24 megabases of DNA between any two individuals, whereas SNPs between any two individuals uh, contribute perhaps 2.5 megabases. So in terms of real estate, CNVs are a larger source of genetic variation, but if you count each CNV as one unit, it's, it's less than SNPs. So it, it depends how you count. And much like dbSNP that I mentioned earlier, the database of genomic variants is, is sort of the, the database that people look to that characterizes um, uh, CNVs. So this is an example of a study someone did. It just came out, I think, in 2007. And this is uh, Craig Venter's genome, where they looked at chromosomes from his mom, chromosomes from his dad, and compared each one by one. So look at. Craig Venter's mom's chromosome compared to Craig Venter's dad's chromosome, and look at the differences and count them up and categorize them and so forth, and just keep going all the way through. And what they found is, as I say, if you count discrete differences, so each CNV, even if it's a megabase long, just counts as one, then non-SNP variation, including CNVs, only counts as 22 percent. But if you count up the real estate, it's 74 percent. So that 0.1 percent that I mentioned on my second slide, where they thought that everybody was 99.9 was percent identical, well, that's starting to look like it's not quite right. In fact, it's 99.5 percent identical. And in fact, about a year and a half ago, I shared a cab ride with this guy in Spain, and he told me he thinks it's more like 98 percent identical, which is kind of surprising. But as I say, it's still early days. So, what's that difference about human and chimpanzee? Yeah, I know. So now they always used to say humans and chimpanzees were 99%. So I guess, you know, I guess we're more like chimpanzees than each other. I don't, I don't think so. So <laughs> it doesn't make much sense. So I, I don't, you know, obviously it's still early days um, and people don't really know yet quite what's going on. But again, what the focus, the NIH focus of this is, is to, to you know, contribute to human health, right? So what people are trying to do, and you notice this paper actually predates those 2004 papers, is find now not SNPs, but CNVs that are associated with disease. So you know, more and more papers are coming out saying, oh, well, there's a, this is a triplication associated with Parkinson's disease. Here's a paper from 2006 associating a duplication with Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is some copy number with uh, Crohn's disease, and the, it seemed the most common type of disease that's associated with copy number variation so far seems to be neuropsychiatric disorders like autism, schizophrenia, and stuff like that. And, you know, biologists could speculate as to why that is, but um, most papers coming out are, are something like autism, it seems like, when, that have been associated so far. But, one, um, one thing you might speculate is a real good candidate for uh, association with copy number variation, one good candidate disease would be different sorts of cancers. And the reason you might think that is because unlike most diseases, cancer is really a disease of two genomes. 
so you have the inherited part of cancer, but in the tumor, the, the DNA just goes wild, and you have a completely different genome in cancer. I mean, you can have four copies of chromosome 16 in the tumor. You know, you can, it just, it just goes, goes crazy. So since there's so much uh, copy number variation in, in um, somatic copy number variation, not inherited, and chromosomal instability, you might speculate that inherited copy number variation could very well be um, uh, associated with, with cancer susceptibility, although as of yet, nobody's published anything showing that. And this is a very, very old slide. People have known for a long time that, that gains and losses of genomic DNA on the somatic level, again, not inherited, are associated with cancer. And you can see that, that this particular individual um, has, say, three copies of chromosome 14, a big loss on chromosome uh, 8, and, and all sorts of things. And, you know, these can happen on the gross level like this or on the, the more microscopic level where little bits of DNA are just floating around in the cell, or even on the submicroscopic level where you can't see it under a microscope, but, you know, there's more like a megabase, say, duplicated or deleted. So, so <clears throat> um, because of this, people actually, almost from the get-go when SNP arrays were produced, realized, well, we can find these copy number changes using SNP arrays even though they're designed to genotype SNPs, it turns out that you can use them to um, find amplifications and deletions of chromosomes. And one of the reasons for that is because of the SNP genotypes, because you have this loss of heterozygosity where you lose one of the parental chromosomes or a piece of it. So the SNP genotypes will turn from heterozygous to homozygous. But also people realize that you can use that brightness, that intensity on the SNP array as a proxy for the copy number, the amount of DNA that's there. So, you know, the earliest paper that I'm aware of came some eight years ago um, using these the very, very early versions of the SNP arrays, which had something like a thousand SNPs on them. And um, these are the first papers that I'm aware of that actually use them to do copy number. But you notice they, they really pretty much predate the, um, the discovery of germline copy number variation on a large scale. So this is just interrogating somatic copy number variation in the tumor genome. So subsequently, you know, from the computational side where, where I come from, um, many, many, many algorithms, including some I worked on as a postdoc, have been developed to convert that SNP array data into copy number inferences. And for some reason in the community, everything has to have its little acronym so, um, you know, there's all these, this alphabet soup of acronyms, and, you know, they're all different in some way, but they really all rely on the same principle, and that is, you know, you run a normal genome that's supposed to represent the copy number two signal, if you can just think of that as your denominator in a sense, and then the numerator is the intensity from your test sample or your tumor, and any time that ratio is significantly bigger than one, for a, for a stretch of SNPs, you can infer that there's an amplification there. Anytime it's significantly less than one, you can infer a deletion. So this is, again, one of the earlier papers that um, shows that data. And you can see from chromosome 8 that you can see some, some high-level amplifications, and these are normal regions, and then some, some um, hemizygous deletions. So I'll just, since this is a more computationally oriented crowd, I'll just briefly touch on um, some of the ways that in the past we've modeled um, this, this uh, copy number, I'm sorry, the probe intensity as a, as a function of copy number. And this is uh, work that we did with the 500K array, which is the predecessor to the current Affymetrix array. So it can interrogate 500,000 SNPs, only 500,000 SNPs across the genome. And this earlier version actually used 24 probes to interrogate each SNP. So 500,000 times 24, that's, what, six point some million, I think. Um, is that right? No. 12, yeah, that's right. <laughs> some 12 million uh, measurements from this array. And, <clears throat> oh yeah, because it's, it's actually two chips, that's why. So um, 
What we did is we took this 24 probe probe set that interrogated each SNP and sort of dichotomized it in a bunch of ways. So back then, Affymetrics had the perfect match probes and the mismatch probes, which, which I think they still use for expression arrays. And each probe could be either classified as perfect match or mismatch. Each probe interrogated either the A allele or the B allele. Remember, there's two different SNP alleles. And each probe was either centered so that its middle base was a 13th base, or it was sort of moved along so it wasn't necessarily the middle base that, um, that it was interrogating. So, or that was the SNP site. So, um, so what I mean by that is suppose this is our target DNA fragment that's floating around in the soup, as I mentioned before, and the SNP site here is indicated in teal. So what you would have is you'd have these four probes that, you know, for most of the probe, it was perfectly complementary. See, A's go with T's, G's go with C's, all the way up to the SNP site. And the perfect match probes, the A and B probes, would be perfectly complementary to either the A allele or the C allele. But the mismatch probes, they would alter the middle base so that it would mismatch. And it, they designed it this way so that it would kind of measure background signal. That was kind of the original idea. They've actually since abandoned this, this um, design. And then the offset probes were similar, but hmm, seems to be dying up. Okay. Um, the offset probes were similar, except now the SNP site is not the middle probe. So on the mismatch probe, when you alter the middle base, you actually get a differential number of sites at which it mismatches the target sequence. So the mismatch offset A probes mismatch the target sequence for the B allele at two spots and the A allele at one spot. So what we did is we just counted up the number of bases that each probe mismatched the target DNA sequence. And you, know, you could just make a table so all 24 probes fit into one of these categories. And we built our model based on this, this table on the right with the model assumption, which is um, sort of biologically or biochemically quite reasonable. That is that the, the less bases at which they mismatch, the stronger the binding will be. In other words, the, the, great, the, the stronger the match in terms of Watson-Crick base pairs, the stronger the binding should be and the brighter the signal you would expect. So we built this model. We built a model of probe intensity as a function of so-called allele-specific copy number. And what we meant by that was that we were going to count not just the total copy number, but how many copies of the A allele the individual had and how many copies of the B allele the individual had. So what that means is that for a normal genotype, if a person just has one from mom and one from dad, <coughs> If they have an AA genotype, then CA would be 2 and CB would be 0. If they have an AB genotype, CA and CB would be 1, both of them. And if they had a, a BB genotype, CA would be 0 and CB would be 2. So <clears throat> the model that we built, um, and it actually turned out we did a lot of model fitting procedures and model diagnostics, and it turns out to describe the data quite well, um, is a generalized linear model. So all it is is it's modeling the probe intensity as a log linear function of um, the allele specific copy numbers. And um, the proportionality contents, constants or the parameters as it were in the model that gamma, alpha, and beta um, are just depend upon this table. So you know the slope as it were since this is a linear model um, the, the larger the affinity between the probe and the target sequence, the, the stronger you'd expect the binding. And that would be reflected in a, um, in a larger uh, parameter corresponding to that particular um, state. So we, we, fit, we could fit it across many, many samples. And um, we fit it separately for the two strands, but I, I won't get into that. And it seemed to work out pretty well. So what we could do with that is those were the allele-specific copy numbers. And just doing a little bit of work from the allele-specific copy numbers, you could then infer the parent-specific copy numbers, which means 
you could get a plot of not just what the copy numbers were across the genome, but what the copy number from each inherited parent was, which can have implications in um, association studies. So you can see here, I, I guess this requires a little bit of explanation, each, um, the, the y-axis, or sorry, the x-axis here is across the genome chromosome by chromosome. So the height of, you can think of this as 500,000 little SNPs, little tiny bars, each at a SNP site, and the total height of each bar is the total copy number um, at that particular locus. So these are two separate lung cancer cell lines that I'm showing. So that's why the karyotype is a big mess, because if, if it were a normal individual, you would expect copy number two across the genome. And you would expect one copy from mom and one copy from dad, which are the red and green portions of the bar. But here, since this is the, a tumor sample, you have these really high copy number um, loci. You have hemizygous deletion, which means you lose one of the parental copies. And you also have homozygous deletion, which is indicated here in black. So you can sort of get a snapshot of what's going on. And, you know, the, the underlying idea is that the genes that sort of live in here are your candidate oncogenes, because presumably the tumor cell likes to see those guys amplify. So that's the general idea behind that. So that's sort of looking at the um, sporadic or somatic aspect of, the, of cancer as a disease. But what about the germline component, the inherited component, and how can we use SNP arrays beyond just genotyping? How can we use SNP arrays to interrogate that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, copy number variation is quite important, but already a lot of work is being done just finding the SNP genotypes that correspond to using these arrays. So this is a very recent um, issue of Nature Genetics where they're doing genome-wide association studies just looking at SNPs at a variety of lung cancers. So now we're back to not looking at tumor DNA, but just looking at a patient's inherited DNA, so say from their blood. Okay, so this is um, a genome-wide association study they did for lung cancer, they did for colorectal cancer and colorectal cancer. All three of these papers are from the same issue of Nature Genetics and all three used either the Affymetrix or the Illumina array uh, in their study. So the idea is they genotyped a big panel, say hundreds or even thousands of individuals that didn't have cancer and individuals that did have cancer and look for differences in SNP allele frequency between the two groups. So that's the general idea, but as I mentioned, you can interrogate copy number with SNP arrays too. So what we're working on and a lot of other groups as well, and there have been several papers published, is not trying to interrogate necessarily tumor DNA for copy number, but trying to find copy number variants, inherited copy number variants of the type that were in, uh, discovered on a large scale in 2004 using these, these particular platforms. So what I'm about to describe is actually some work that Gokan Yavas, who is a student of Mehmet's and Morales in the computer science department, has been working on to try to um, develop a new methodology to find copy number variation. And most people use, most groups that when they're using these SNP arrays to try to find CNVs, use a modeling approach, kind of like I described before, um, where they try to model probe intensity as a function of copy number, and then they usually use some hidden Markov model or segmentation approach to find regions of gain and loss. But Gokhan's actually taking a fundamentally different approach where he's trying to use a function, uh, functional optimization approach where the, ideally the true solution, the true copy number state is the optimum of a certain objective function, specifically the minimum. So just to, to get a little bit more specific about the uh, 6.0 array, um, unlike the one I described before where you had 24 probes and the mismatch and the perfect match and everything, Affymetrix has really simplified their design for the latest version in that they use just three probes, and they're actually exactly the same sequence, to interrogate each SNP. And the only difference between the two probes 
is that they just change the SNP site. So here it's the T and the G that you can see there. So basically your raw data looks like six measurements times a million. And there are actually these other, uh, another million measurements that I won't get into called CMV probes, but you can think about it that way. So the data that we've been working with is, um, it's from the 270 HapMap samples, which is the result of a, a different effort called the International HapMap Project. But the important part is that it's 270 individuals of varying ethnicities. So we have this enormous data set. Um, Affymetrix had to ship it on, I forget how many DVDs, like five different DVDs, because it's just it's such a huge data set. And um, we're, we're sort of combing through it to discover CNVs. And fortunately, there are some, for these particular samples, there are some sort of well-validated CNVs, duplications and deletions that, that people accept. Ah, this particular individual has a little deletion on chromosome 18. So we can use those as positive controls to evaluate the method. So the first goal is to take these six intensity values and convert them into a single measure of raw copy number. So we use this sort of regression approach that gives you, as I say, a raw, i.e. noisy version of what the copy number is. So what you'd ideally like is, I mean, if in a perfect world, if the individual has copy number two there, when you did this transformation, you'd get two for your raw copy number. But it doesn't work that way. Um, this is sort of a typical view of what the raw copy number looks like when you first run that. So you can see that it's sort of centered around two, but it's really noisy. And you know, we're trying to detect, it's not like in cancer where you're looking for 14 copies. I mean, that's very, very rare in the germline. What you're looking for typically is three copies or one copy. Sometimes you get zero copies or four copies. So you can see that if you try to parse that noisy diagram and to find regions where there's copy number three or copy number one, it would be pretty difficult. So Gokan sort of developed this method where it's, it's sort of a multi-stage process where first you kind of do a naive approach to get candidate regions, but those are filled with false positives, and then he applies his objective function approach. So this is, this on the right is the first pass where you run uh, a low pass filter to sort of smooth the data. So you can see it's still pretty noisy, but that allows us via thresholding method to give initial candidate regions. So these are the regions that the objective function is applied to. And the objective function, so yeah, I should, I should describe this a little bit. This is, um, this is, looking, it's actually a fairly, looks like a 5 KB region of, of uh, chromosome, is that right? Yeah, about 5 KB region of, of chromosome 1. And each dot represents a smooth raw copy number signal. And it's colored according to whether it's normal, which is red, or candidate gain, or duplication, I guess we're calling it candidate duplication, which is in green, or candidate deletion, which is in blue. So what we try to do is to say, this is sort of a liberal algorithm at this stage, and we say, which ones of these are real, and which ones of these do we think are false? <clears throat> so the, um, the objective function that we've come up with is actually quite simple, but it seems to be quite effective based on various sorts of assessments we've been using. So what it is is you try to strike a balance between you want all the regions of gain to have low variance. In other words, if, if you have a set of SNPs that are all supposed to be in the same class, you would expect them to have roughly not too, not too much variation in raw copy number. But at the same time, you have to balance that with, if you, if you took that approach drastically, you'd wind up with these really small one SNP regions because you know, if you just have one SNP, you have no variance, basically. No variance, basically. So you balance that with this cut function, which penalizes for jumping too much from state to state. So this is a bit of a simplified version, but those summations are taken over the three states, duplication, deletion, and normal. And uh, that alpha is just sort of a tuning parameter. So 
So in this version of the function, there's only one tuning parameter. And it seems to work pretty well because we have a sort of set of gold standard validated regions. We also have access to the DNA. You can order the DNA from a biorepository company, take it to the lab, which we've been doing, and do low throughput experiments to find these whether these regions of deletion or gain that haven't been described before are actually real. So, um, oh yeah, and the optimization of this function, if you try to, to optimize it over the entire genome, especially 270 samples, it's way too computationally burden, burdensome. So what we've been using is a simulated annealing approach to estimate where the optimum is, and that is decide whether or not each region is true or, or false. So this is a typical result. The, the blue triangles that are around the blue dots represent the region as reported in a previous paper that, that validated this um, experimentally. So this is a validated region according to the blue triangles, and the blue dots are, um, are Gokhan's um, inferences using the um, uh, objective function approach. And similarly, you can th see things like amplifications, which would be tricky given sort of the noise on the right, but um, it seems to, to do a good job with that. So we're sort of actively honing this approach and sort of trying to get a re manuscript ready and so forth. So this sort of begs the question, what about the future? I mentioned that um, the Affymetrics 1 million array and the Illumina 1 million array were released almost two years ago, or maybe even more than two years ago at this point. So why is there not now a 2 million array or a 5 million array or a 10 million array or 6 million array or something like that? And in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, although some people agree with it, is that in, say, another 3 to 10 years, I think arrays are SNP arrays, not, ex not expression arrays necessarily, but SNP arrays for this particular purpose are going to be dead. And that's because there's a new technology coming down the pike that I think is going to replace almost all of these applications, especially in cancer, because there are certain special things about the tumor genome that SNP arrays are blind to. And the things that SNP arrays are blind to, SNP arrays can find copy number change that happens in the tumor genome, but a huge class of, um, of DNA level changes that occur somatically are translocations or rearrangements. And SNP arrays, you know, some people have tried, but really there's no way to use SNP arrays to, to find these things. This is when a chunk of, say, chromosome 5 gets glued up with a chunk of chromosome 8 and fused together. And it's really important, especially if that splits a gene. And SNP arrays, you can't find it. Forget about it. Same with point mutations. If you have a point mutation, which are really important, somatic point mutation, you can't find it with SNP arrays. Um, there's also something called epigenetic changes and methylation, which with a little bit of work, you can use other technologies, but you really can't do them with SNP arrays. So what can find these, these different classes of rearrangements? Well, the, the technology that's sort of going to revolutionize things in the very near future is whole genome sequencing. And maybe folks here have heard a lot about it. I mean, they've been, there's something new called the Thousand Genomes Project that's, that's getting a lot of buzz right now. And that's not necessarily, in, that's not in cancer at all, but it's sort of, sequencing the entire genome of not just one individual, which was the goal of the Human Genome Project, but a thousand individuals. And the thing that enabled it, the Human Genome Project to, to sequence one human genome was 500 million bucks using capillary sequencing. The cost of capillary sequencing has come down, but it's still $10 million to sequence one individual using that method. But these next generation sequencers, which are manufactured by the, the three big ones right now that are on the market are manufactured by Selexa, which Illumina bought. So Illumina owns that, now owns that technology. 454, which Roche bought, and um, ABI, uh, solid. The next generation sequencers 
um, can do so-called 20x coverage, which means you can, each base gets sequenced an average of 20 times, which you need to be able to sort of piece everything back together. That only costs currently $100,000, but people anticipate that cost is going to decrease dramatically. And um, so a proof of principle paper, folks at the Sanger Center um, in England published this just in June, where as a proof of principle, they said, well, let's take tumor DNA, run it through a sequencer, and see what we can come up with in terms of inferences. And it, it turns out already, and again, this is still quite expensive, so SNP rays aren't dead quite yet, but this will become much more cheap, and it turns out they can do all the copy number stuff, plus the real thrust of this paper was to find these translocations. And so they showed, using paradigm sequencing, which I'm not really going to be able to get into, that you can find lots and lots of translocations and examine the whole complexity of the genome in the tumor and not just uh, using cancer. I mean, not just, sorry, uh, copy number. So here's, um, so Yoon Su Pyon, who's Jing Li's student, and uh, he's been working with me to analyze some of this, this enormous data. So this is just one lung cancer sample. And before I was talking about how big the data sets were with SNP arrays, well, these things absolutely dwarf the SNP array data. So the data that Yoon's been playing with comes from that paper I just showed, and it's 36.2 million paired reads, which means it's 70 letters, 35 bases from each pair, or each, each um, end of the read. So these guys are paired. So you can think of it as 70, roughly 70 bases and times uh, 36.2 million. So the, the, I think when we downloaded the data set, it was, it was 30 gigs zipped, and this is just one sample. So it's, it's really going to be enormous, and we're already having all sorts of data <laughs> management issues, but I won't get into that. So the idea is that you take these reads, you have these little sequences that you know, they just took the tumor DNA, they threw them through this machine, and they got all these little sequences, which then, thanks to the Human Genome Project, you can map back to the genome, see where they are in the human genome. And from the copy number perspective, how can you find copy number from that? Well, any time you get more reads than you'd expect by chance, any place in the genome, you can infer an amplification there. And any place, say you see no reads in a big part of the genome, well, probably there's a um, uh, homozygous deletion there. And if you see a, a not so big depletion, then it's a hemizygous deletion. So that's the general principle. But there are all sorts of um, mapping quality issues. You have to be sure you know where it is and so forth. So even though you start with 36.2 million reads, you actually wind up with considerably less than that. And in the end, I guess the high mapping quality reads, there are only uh, 7.3 million pairs, but it still suffices to do a lot with it. So this is what the, the raw sequence that, that we downloaded looks like. So there are 36.2 million of these sequences that are in the, um, the big zip file that we downloaded. And it's in so-called FASTQ format. Each of those are 70 bases long, and underneath it's some code that tells you how high the quality of the sequence read was. In other words, how confident they are that that is the sequence that they actually read. And then there's a program that's actually amazingly fast, and I guess that's why it's becoming so popular, called MAQ, that was developed at Richard Durbin's group at the Sanger Center, that can then take those reads and quickly map them to the genome. So you just sort of run through that. We have the whole human genome sitting on our cluster, so all three billion pairs that represent the consensus sequence. And then all these reads get mapped, and then you can take a windowing approach to say how many reads in this window, how many reads in this window, and you can plot that. And that's much as probe intensity was a proxy for copy number in the SNP array setting, reads per window is a proxy for copy number in the um, the sequencing setting. So this is some work that Yoon did to sort of 
basically say how many reads would you expect per window. And he basically chopped up the human genome and ran it through this MAQ program. And again, I, I was amazed at how quickly he was able to do it. But um, as I say, the principle is just to count the number of reads per window, and that's sort of like your raw copy number in a sense. And then to smooth it, Yoon is developing a hidden Markov model approach to infer a copy number from, um, from these reads per window. So it's, it's still a bit of a work in progress. We're having all sorts of technical issues, but this is what the raw copy number looks like. So for this particular cancer sample, you can see chromosome 10 looks fairly constant. In fact, it looks like it is, actually. So um, even the eye can tell that chromosome 10 doesn't look so crazy, whereas chromosome 11 does. And, and in fact, these, these are well-known amplifications. This, for example, this really high-level one right around um, 80 megabases is, is well-known. So you can actually use this as a proxy for raw copy number. And the HMM, just to quickly go through it, um, we've, it's a five-state HMM. So these are the hidden states, are the copy numbers, and they stand for low-level deletions, um, mid-level deletions, normal, mid-level amplifications, and then high-level amplifications. The observed values are the number of reads per window, and then it's actually completely straightforward to figure out what the, the distribution uh, for the emission would be. So that's what that is. It turns out it's just binomial, and you can use, others have suggested just using normal approximation, which should be just fine. And uh, the transition probability for this HMM, interestingly, is really a biological question, because you're asking what's the likelihood of transitioning from a normal state to an amplified state at any given SNP. And um, that really is a, is a biological question, but the community has sort of worked this out, so he borrowed some of this from an earlier paper which used SNP arrays um, to, to build an HMM. So, you know, we've been working on this for a while, and then just, if you look at the data on this paper, this just came out, what, 12 days ago, somebody actually said, well, heck, we're just gonna do an entire leukemia genome, and we're not just gonna only do 36.2 million reads, we're gonna do 5.2 billion reads. So this just came out where they were, they were really looking for point mutations, but they wanted to do 30x coverage. So if you can imagine that one sample with 36.2 million reads was 30 gigs zipped, this is 5.2 million reads from one, or 5.2 billion reads for one sample. So it's just, they don't even post it because, you know, it would take several months probably to download via the internet. So, I, you know, I don't know where this is heading, but you can imagine that the, the complexity and the enormity of this data is such that you could almost have a da a, a one database per individual. I mean, each individual deserves its own database if you have data of this complexity. So, you know, I think this is a real opportunity, not for me, since I'm not really trained as a computer scientist, but for more database-oriented people in computer science to be able to handle this kind of data, because more and more of it's going to be coming down the pike. And um, I think this is really where the, the future is going with regard to, to this kind of work. So I'll just close with my acknowledgments slide. Um, the folks in my group, and former and present in the genetics department, the folks that I've, I've borrowed from computer science, including Yoon and Gokan that I've mentioned before, and uh, collaborators from Boston and, and elsewhere that have been working on this sort of thing with me. And thanks for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Well, you know, interest well, interestingly, I think, you know, it seems to me that it's almost less of a cost issue because everyone, everyone thinks that within 10 years, it'll be $1,000 a 
or so, or, or lower, say, to do whole genome sequencing of the sort that are, that's in this paper, per individual. And, and that's basically what SNP arrays cost a few years ago. So I don't, I don't think it's going to be a cost issue, but really a data management issue. I mean, you know, the cost to actually run the sequencing, I think, will, will get cheaper and cheaper. But, you know, how are you going to handle this data? I mean, it's just immense. I mean, you need, you know, so, so one of the big genome-wide association studies that came out about a year or so ago is the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, where they did 14,000 cases from a variety of diseases and 3,000 controls. So that's 17,000 people. They did it all on, I think, the 500K Affymetrix array. So in terms of cost, I think that, that you know, in 10 years, the, the cost would be the same to do whole genome sequencing on 17,000 individuals. But the data enormity is just, is just mind-boggling. I mean, I can't even imagine. So I think the, the computing is what hasn't kept up. And I think that's going to be the big opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not something that I'm at all comfortable or an expert in, but I think, you know, as I say, it's really a database per individual in a sense. So. Yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, so there, that's the difference between, you know, sort of genotyping CNPs and de novo discovery of CNPs. And so I guess, um, you know, much as people sort of agree where most of the SNPs are now, as you say, probably in the not too distant future, people were, will agree where most of the CNPs are. But I guess the difference is that, um, and I sort of glossed over this, but these, for example, and this isn't the true with everything, but sorry. There we go. This last paper here, if you notice the word de novo, that means that it actually is not an inherited copy number, um, it, uh, copy number change. It's actually something that happens sporadically for whatever reason. So, you know, there's always going to be these, these copy number changes that occur sporadically. So this isn't like tumors where it's isolated to the tumor. It's, through the, it's in all these individual cells, but they didn't inherit from the parent. Say one of the, the father's sperm cells had a deletion in there and got passed on to the kid. So, um, so those sorts of things, you know, they're not ancestral, so it's not, it's not quite the same thing. So I think there'll always be a need to sort of look for these de novo copy number changes. But, but um, you know, the Affymetrix 6.0 array is already designed to find some of the probes they have are specifically put there where there are known CNPs. So I think you're right in that regard. In the somatic cells with cancer, with tumor, uh, you observe many chromosomal duplications and things like that. Uh, so while doing uh, association studies, is it at all possible to uh, differentiate uh, driver genes and passenger genes? Because there will be many passenger genes that come with the chromosomal duplication, right? Or what type of data is necessary? So, so the association studies don't look at the tumor DNA. They look at the, the germline DNA, the inherited DNA. And those, you know, don't have these gross changes. So if you're doing an association study with, say, cases and controls, that's not an issue. But it is, you know, for, for several years now, what you're talking about has been an issue where people, you know, say, well, gee, if, if I'm looking for a candidate oncogene, and if my hypothesis is that these candidate oncogenes res reside on pieces of chromosomes that are amplified, what do I do if the whole chromosome is amplified? So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, 
that's a hot topic of discussion in the somatic cancer world right now. How do you, how do you sort of hone in if you have a broad area of amplification? How do you hone in? And one of the, one of the solutions that people try to use is to look across many, many cancer samples and found, find so-called minimal common regions of amplification. And that the hypothesis is that the oncogenes will be there. Or they, they look at expression and look for regions, look for genes when you have an amplification if their expression also goes up. Because it turns out a lot of genes don't. The cell somehow compensates and, and deregulates that. So that's another hypothesis. But I think nobody really knows what to do, actually. Okay, thanks.